Buenos dias, buenas noches, hello, good morning, good evening, welcome back to the Metropolitan Culture Corner. And Happy New Year, by the way, as this is the first interview we are doing in 2023. I hope that your new year is off to a fabulous start. Today, we speak with Barcelona-based painter and designer Pem Marwidi. She has been painting custom pieces for interior designers and private clients since 1989, and her work is instantly recognizable due to its highly personal style, which is filled with shapes and patterns and plants and animals and whimsy and color. Lots and lots and lots of color. Pam started her career in Sarasota, Florida, then studied printed textile design in London and has been based in Barcelona since 2017. Her work ranges from handmade painted pottery to transforming old dark furniture into fun whimsical conversation pieces and from wall murals to fabrics and floor cloths. Each piece, whether it's a coffee cup or the ceiling of an entire room, is filled with magic and joy. Her art is designed to be different, but it's also meant to fit into her clients' everyday lives, into their homes, and to make people smile. She's been featured in multiple books and has worked with clients from all over the globe. Please welcome Pam Marwidi to the very first installment of Barcelona Metropolitan's Metropolitan Culture Corner in 2023. In the art and design world, I think a lot of young people are scared off having a creative career by their parents. You've got to be really committed to what you want to do to get through that because it's very easy to be dissuaded. Oh, go to business school instead. That'll be much better for you. And if you're not that kind of person, it could be a lifetime of real suffering doing something you're not in love with. But a lot of young people, they can paint, they can draw, they're a little bit arty. And it's my opinion, it's very important to be educated culturally, how to think, how to think about the world around you, but also to learn technically how to make things in the visual world, in the design world. I'm a trained designer. I'm not necessarily a fine artist by any stretch of the imagination. In my world, I would tell any aspiring designers to go to school and get trained, how to understand what taste is, how to dispense with taste when necessary, and get a real feeling of how all that works. And also just technical stuff, you know, how to paint, how to draw how to make things work. I'm very, very grateful to have been able to do the kind of work I've done professionally for so many years and make a living at it. I'm very, very fortunate and very happy. Wow, you look lovely. I love the green. Thank you. Talk to me. What do you want to know? And I'll talk back. I like these interviews for people to really get to know the artist, not just the typical bullet points on the biography and that's it. So how did you get started as an artist in the first place? Did transforming furniture come first? Did you start with painting? That's a fair question. I think that when I was a kid, I was always one of those kids that was always drawing and painting things. My mother encouraged it. She always made sure I had something to do. So I was always busy with my hands and I really liked color and drawing and making things. That kind of continued up into young adulthood and I was painting furniture for fun in my room and it was sort of something we did in the family. My mother was always painting furniture, so it seemed perfectly natural to paint furniture. I grew up in Spain. I grew up here. Oh, really? I grew up in Barcelona. And I discovered unpainted pottery, you know, the piggy banks and those round money banks. They're just raw clay. And I loved painting on them. And I was painting little scenes. I was like a teenager. And I just kept doing it and doing it. And I started selling it to friends in school. And it was something that was really part of my life and I really liked. I studied graphic design for a little while at Tascola Masana here in Barcelona. And that, I think I was a little too young to grasp it entirely. And it was also very technical. It was a lot about letters and textures and cutting things and making them fit. It was graphic design, you know, it wasn't painting. So I kind of wandered around for a little bit. I kind of floated through young adulthood. And somebody suggested to me that I look at printed textiles. By that time, I was living in England, moved to England with my parents. I was in my early 20s. And I found that the whole concept of the way printed textiles was taught in England was very interesting. It was basically what at the time was also called surface design. And it was teaching students to learn to design pattern for fabric, for wallpapers, for gift wrap, for anything that has a surface, uh, waste paper bins, anything. And I got into a very good course at Middlesex. Now it's the university, it was Polytechnic there. And did a fabulous, fabulous course called Printed Textiles. And I really learned how to be a designer. And that included the whole gambit of interior design, designing for furnishing fabrics, as well as dress fabrics. Fabrics, but there was a definite categorization. We do fashion and dress fabrics and things like that, which was cool, but also the idea of designing for furnishings, for wallpaper, for walls. We learned how to paint canvas floor cloths, was one of our school projects. And I was given instruction on how to design, not just paint things. We were taught, you have a thing, a three-dimensional thing. 
how to make it look good, what works, what doesn't work, what's weak, what's strong. It was a fabulous education and it was very good for me to have that. And when I finished that course, I, for various circumstances, went back to live in the States with my parents. Then we moved back to the States, not to Connecticut where I was born, but to Florida. My parents were getting a little older by then and they liked the idea of being warm. So we ended up in Sarasota and I had extreme luck in landing in that part of the world at a time where there was a lot of building. It was a big boom time in Sarasota. A lot of building, a lot of people buying second homes. A demographic that was able to have custom painting done in their home. And I did a lot of beautiful, beautiful work, mostly through interior designers, painting in people's homes, murals, furniture, fabrics. And that was pretty much my professional career forever. Going from studying this really interesting application of art to actually having clients isn't that simple. Does it just come from word of mouth or did you go not? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was word of mouth. It was pretty seamless. It was a question of being in the right time, at the right place, with the right set of skills. It was in the early 90s, I guess, and everything was painted. It was painted finishes. People were writing books about painting, paint finishes. And I was like, wow, that's what I do. Later on, minimalism came, and that was not my friend. That was not good for me. But at the time, it was like everybody wanted something painted, and boy, there I was. I really had a lot of fun painting very interesting projects with clients who were very excited about what I was doing. Some of your murals or some of your pieces are painted right into the space, like right on the wall, for example. Yeah. And other pieces are things that you can prepare for maybe in your studio and then it can be moved. So how does that change yeah. the capacity to move the piece versus knowing that it'll be a permanent fixture? How does that influence your approach? Yeah, a very interesting question because a lot of times people are a little anxious about, well, gee, you know, we really like what you're going to paint and you're going to paint it on the wall. And if we move, we can't take it with us. Hmm, bummer. And in some cases, the things were so big or on different walls, like a corner, something that would be hard to install on canvas. Where possible, I often suggested painting it on canvas. And I did up to pretty large ones, eight by 10 feet, three, four meters across, maybe two meters high. That can be painted on canvas. And so I would paint the canvas in my studio, which also required being able to have a big enough wall to hang the canvas on to do it in my studio. And that depended on where I was living at the time. And I worked it out. And then I would just apply the canvas right to the wall and then paint a wooden frame around it to hide nails or staples or whatever. And that worked really good. So if people moved, they just pull it off the wall and roll it up and take it to the next place. So what is the process like from start to finish with that kind of piece? If it's for someone's home, do they come and they give you feedback or you send photos or they just say, you do it <laughs> and that's it. How does that work? Well, usually I would go and make an interview. I, I maybe was an interior designer. Maybe I'd get a brief from the interior designer. She'd say, well, these are the clients. This is what they like. These are their colors. This is what they don't like. They're looking for this kind of thing. I want you to go meet them or I'm going to come with you. We'll go meet them together. So I would sit down with the people and talk to them. Most people, by the time they've gotten to the stage where they're talking to me, they know what they want and they describe what they want. They talk about colors, but in the end, it was pretty much up to me to visualize it and put it on paper first. I would do a rough sketch, see if that's where they wanted to go and if they liked that. Maybe I'd do a few ideas, they'd pick one and I'd go back and work on the sketch some more. And once they felt comfortable, they'd say, yeah, go for it. And my sketches tended to be pretty loose. I wasn't doing perfectly faithful, tiny postage stamp renderings. They were like loose, watercolor, splashes. And the end product would often be a lot different and it always was okay. I've always been impressed with the way people are willing to let the process take place and these aren't necessarily clients who have a lot of experience working with someone painting in their house or a custom painter and they're like yeah well just we're, you're good just keep going you're doing fine we like it and they usually pretty much just let me do what I'm doing and it works out okay. Of course if you're in the house and they're there too they can come in and bug you and say oh could you make that a little more blue or usually it's just like do you want some coffee <laughs> oh. over the years you must have worked with all kinds of people in what way have you noticed your style evolving over the years yeah it's evolved because i've been interested in different ideas and different colors and different techniques sometimes but i've also been influenced by the subject matter of what i've been tasked with painting sometimes a client would come with very specific ideas about what they wanted and i would be out of my comfort zone it would be something maybe i didn't know about it would be a technique I wasn't too sure about or colors I was not thinking in 
in terms of so much. And my job is to make it happen. And so I would have a whole new set of variables to work with, which makes my work interesting. It's boring just to do the same thing all the time, really boring. So if someone comes to me and says, well, the picture of the bull dancer, I mean, that was for a couple who were very interested in Cretan and Minoan culture before classical Greek culture. A very interesting culture that not much is known about. Well, they were real fans of this and experts, and they tasked me with a huge body of work, painted glasses, ceramic dinnerware, and murals on the wall on canvas, so they could take them away. They were definitely like, yeah, we want to keep this with us. And so I began a wonderful study of Minoan and the kind of Neolithic culture that sprang up in Europe in the greater Carpathian, Turkish, Greek area, that part of the world. I was studied by my Marija Gambutas a lot, and she wrote some very good books about that. They were big followers of her. They gave me all these books to read with wonderful drawings of ancient runes and animal figures. And it was like going on a college course. I read all this material. I did sketches. I immersed myself in something I knew nothing about. It was fascinating, and it brought all sorts of new imagery into my work, which continues to be an influence. This was a few years ago. So there's an example of like, wow, okay, I don't know anything about this, but cool. I can do it. What do you think? <laughs> Would you say that was the most challenging request that you've had recently? Or is there another one that you can think of that you feel like, okay, the craziest thing anyone ever asked me was the following? Oh yeah, that wasn't crazy. That was just fun and interesting and required me to do new things, not reinvent myself, but to work with all new material. I guess the craziest thing and not crazy, but the most unusual daunting thing was when I painted the sky, the ceiling in a very, very large exhibition room in a museum that houses a model circus and train model on a huge, huge scale. It's in Sarasota. It's part of the Ringling Museum there and the Circus Museum. And it's a great big room. These people knew me. I had done some work for them in their home. And they said, well, you know, we have this project for you. Will you come down? We're building this really big building and we want a sky with clouds painted. And we're thinking that maybe you're the person to do this. So I went down there and it was so big. It was under construction. I said, I can't do this. This is crazy. I didn't want to commit to something I couldn't fulfill. You know, I didn't want to say, oh yeah, sure. I can do that and then egg on face realize I was physically not able they really really encouraged me they're extremely supportive and they said well look think about it look at it we'll give you some measurements we'll talk about the parameters this is the scheduling this is what we're looking for it's going to be in stages this is how we can help you get it done you know equipment wise and I asked around I asked peers I asked some professional painter friends they said this is the square footage this is what they want what do you think and they're saying yeah you could probably do that it'll take a while but sure and I asked some professional artists fine artists and people who had done large murals and I said what do you think and they were like yes it's big it will take you some weeks maybe a couple of months but it's a legitimate project for one person to take on sure so based on that research I accepted and it was really fun I had to go up on a very very high scaffolding it was about 40 feet high that's about 10 meters you know in a scaffolding it's like four levels and it wiggles it moves and the first time we went up on it, I was absolutely terrified. I was sweating. I hung onto the bars. I couldn't let go. And I was I was afraid I wouldn't be able to do the work because I was too scared to be up high. By about three days later, being up on there, I was completely at ease. It's amazing what you get used to and what you can do physically. I was swinging around on that thing like a monkey. And the project took about two months, I think. Or maybe three. And there were different stages. There were some low areas. There were some areas with birds and trees. And then there was the high up ceiling that needed larger scale clouds. But by the end of it, I'd run across the room, climb up, juk, 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 climb down, lean over. And I even had the guys that were laying the floor roll it for me while I was on top to save going down, unlocking the wheels, rolling it, locking it and going back up again. I just say, hey, you guys, when you get a moment, could you just roll me over? to um, that corner over there. And I'm like, you know, 40 feet up in the air, the thing's swaying like this, and then it's going boom, 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 boom. And it was fine, I wasn't scared at all. I was sad when the project was over. It was like, oh, I'm painting the last cloud. Uh -huh. I'm gonna miss this. Well, I guess it's a good life lesson. When you think something is scary, sometimes you fall in love with it. It sounds like there's not a typical day of work for you, like a typical day in the studio. It sounds like every day is really, really different because you work with so many kinds of mediums. Yeah, definitely. And again, I prefer it that way because it's not boring. Part of the process is changing from one medium to another. For me, sometimes it's hard. And I've heard this from other artists as well. Your mind's working in a certain way. You're using a canvas or you're using something that's two-dimensional and you switch to something three-dimensional and shiny or flat 
like a piece of furniture or different kinds of paints, different liquidity, different drying times. Something that's vertical can't be drippy. The paint has to have some thickness to it so it doesn't fall down or unless you want a drippy effect, which is really cool too. Fabric, I paint lying down on a table. I can pool up the paint. It can be inky and watercolory and the colors can kind of merge and on top of each other. Those things are all fun to be able to switch in and out of that, but sometimes it takes a few days to go from, oh, I was really enjoying painting that wall and now I have to paint this fabric. Oh, this is terrible. I can't do it. Oh, what's the matter with me? I just can't, I'm not feeling it. And then, you know, like a day later, you're like, wow, I never want to stop doing this fabric. This is so cool. And then, of course, another change comes and but it's not boring. Not being boring it presents challenges. You have to resource materials differently. Width of something that's always been challenging is width of canvases and width of fabric. Sometimes it's not easy to obtain the kind of shape I want for something or the length or the width. I've always worked on my own. I've never had any helpers or never worked for anybody either. It's just me. It's up to me to find the materials, solve the problem. That can be very time consuming. This video that you sent me of this incredible pink fabric, what was the story? Story behind that uh, yeah, that was for an interior designer who was doing a big house with some very large furniture. It was to upholster two extremely big armchairs, big wing back armchairs, and they wanted a lot of fabric. It was 30 yards, which is basically 30 meters. That's a lot of fabric. Where do you even paint that? <laughs> like, how do you even piece by that? piece. I have a large painting table. It's a big four foot by eight foot, you know, meter and a half by three meter long piece of wood. I just put everything on that and I staple the fabric on that. I put plastic down and I staple the fabric and stretch it so it's tight and paint on it that way. And I can do about three meters at a time, a little less than three meters. And when that's dry, I just unhook it all. I have a bolt of fabric. It starts with a big round bolt of fabric. Pull down the painted stuff, roll it underneath one end of the table, pull down the white fabric from the bolt at that end, staple it, paint it, same again, repeat, undo it, roll it. So at the end, the white fabric is all gone. And at the other end of the table is a big rolled up bolt of painted fabric. I know you've talked about floor cloths before. Is that the same process to create a floor cloth? I know you've been featured in books about them and everything. So of all people, yeah. that seem like the one oh, that- I've got a book on the shelf. This is the time I should probably hold a little book up. The painted floor cloth is a 18th century way of people having something that looked like an oriental woven carpet, Persian carpet on the floor without having to have that expensive item in your home. So it was sort of a folk thing. It was very popular in the Americas because of course it's harder to get Persian carpet in 18th century America than maybe in Europe. So people painted them. And it is actually what became the foundation idea for linoleum. So if you ever pulled linoleum apart or old linoleum, it has strings in it. It was the fabric base and they put gook on it and then made linoleum. So painted canvas for a canvas floor cloth is very thick canvas, much thicker than you would use for a wall painting. And I stretch those as well, either on a wall or on this table if they fit. Many of the floor cloths I did were pretty large and I would hopefully be able to find a large wall that I could staple into in my studio or somewhere. I was always able to manage that once in my parents' garage because I needed a long wall. And they were okay, so just paint it when you're done. Paint it back up again, patch the holes. Paint, 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 paint. Take it down, trim the edges. I seal the edges and you just lay it on the floor and you can walk on it. How do those pieces stand up over time? I mean, because that's a lot of wear and tear, no? They on. stand up very, very well. They're very hard wearing. I had some floor cloths in my own house to see how much abuse it could take. They can withstand a lot of foot traffic over the years. Not to imply that painting is easy or that it always looks exactly like what maybe you had first envisioned, but you can sort of control the outcome. But if you're working with a kiln, for example, or firing clay and glazes and things, that can really affect the look of the final piece. How is that process different for you as an artist? Because it must be quite a different feeling to working with the kiln versus seeing what's coming off the brush, right? Very astute question. Yes, it is very different. When I first started painting pottery and ceramics, it wasn't something I had studied before. Again, this was the case of a client wanting painted tiles in my style. I had done some work for them, furniture, floor cloths, pillows, the whole gamut of what I was expert at. And they said, we would love you to do some painted tiles. And I said, well, I'm very sorry. I don't do tiles. I don't know how to do fire. Any I don't know how to do it. I have no idea at all. There are some very good tile artists I can recommend to you. I said, no, no, Pam, you don't know understand we want you to do it come on you can do it get someone to figure it out for you and do a test you know humor us and I said okay 
So I went around again and asked some people I knew that did it. And I thought, well, I hope they don't get mad at me like I'm trying to move in on them. These people were so gracious and so helpful. They said, oh, gosh, no, Pam, here, it's so easy. Do this. Get the tiles here. These are the kind of paints you use. Just play with them and fire them and see how it works. You'll see what works and what doesn't. Just do it. So I did. And of course, when you paint with glazes and under glazes, they don't have any color. Or if they do, it's a very faint color or it's not a color that even looks like the way it's going to turn out. But it's amazing how much you can learn by doing and remembering what worked. This little weird gray pink color is bright red or this little weird brownie green color is like blue or turquoise and you just learn it. You make color charts of what colors are and then you look at them like i need okay i need this yellow this green this is too bright no black here no and the other thing about ceramics which i absolutely love is what the kiln does because all the colors change and run into each other they can become transparent they can stand out from each other and you really never know when you open the kiln it's like okay let's see what happened what did my kiln friend do for me and there's always the surprise You've said that you really like that your art ends up being a part of people's daily lives, whether it's a ceramic piece or furniture or floor cloth. So when you first started out, was there ever a sense of not wanting to let these pieces go? Was it always just like, nope, do with them what you will and enjoy your life? I think it could be kind of hard for an artist to let go of their stuff. There are some things I have done that I've looked back and I think, wow, that would really be cool to have. Because the larger works are so large and they're so specific, they're almost kind of like out of my hands. I don't feel attached. It's not my furniture it's not my wall the hardest things to part with sometimes is the pottery pieces because they are small and i could keep them or i could do two sometimes i've done that i'll do extras because for a custom order especially if there's a deadline if something is damaged in the firing it's good to have a couple of spares sometimes that's hard to do if it's very very specific pieces but often i'll do one or two or three extras and then i get a little souvenir of a piece also with fabric i've done extra yards extra meters mm -hmm. so i have had the opportunity to keep some of that experience in my home as well but yeah sometimes it's hard to say goodbye to them but it's nice to see them in context. Thank you for talking with us and for sharing your art with us, Pam. Our stuff is just so much fun, right? With all the negative things going on in the world today, pandemics, energy crises, uh, reggaeton, I mean, a little art to just brighten our daily lives seems not only to be a good idea, but kind of necessary, don't you think? So thank you for tuning in this month. See you in one month's time, right here, same time, same channel on the Metropolitan Culture Corner, where we will go behind the scenes with yet another one of Barcelona's super cool creative people. Until then, keep supporting your local arts and culture scene. And don't forget that you can watch all of our interviews dating back to March 2020 on Barcelona Metropolitan's official YouTube channel, or you can listen to the interviews as podcasts on SoundCloud. Stay safe and see you next month.